Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Preacher Boys podcast. I'm glad to have Kathy Durbin back on the show. You may recognize her from a previous episode we did where she talked about her time at Victory Christian Academy. If you haven't heard that episode, it may be helpful before you listen to this one to just go back, uh, take a listen to her story there, and then pick up at the beginning of of this episode. But um, right now, Kathy is dealing with another situation and is currently going through the legal process uh, relating to this case. Uh, but I, I want to just basically start off your story from getting back from the girl's home and kind of where we left off on our last interview, talking about, you know, getting back involved at Faith Baptist Wildemar, you know, starting to be back in that world and what life was like from, from that point. Well, when I came back from the girl's home, I felt very, um, I don't even know what the word it would be. Just like I had to toe this perfect line because if at any time I either had an attitude with my mom or anything, there was a threat to go back, which I knew would not happen. I would kill myself before I would go back to that girl's home. I didn't know what killing yourself even meant really. I mean, suicide really wasn't a big topic then. Um, but I knew I would not let myself go back there. So, but I knew I had to be perfect. I had to listen to everything that I was told to do, go by the book. And for all intents and purposes, I wanted to, I wanted to be a good kid. I wasn't a bad kid when I was sent there. So I tried to toe the line. I went to every activity. I went to everything that the church had. We all did. Our whole family did. Um, but before I go into my story, I think I want to put it in context because this is not something that, I mean, my story is 20, was 27 years old when this, when I first started talking about it two years ago. Now it's 29. So, I mean, you can say 30. Um, This isn't something I just decided to just bring out and talk about. And so I think to put it in context, I'm going to tell a little bit of what happened two and a half years ago, and then I'll go into my story. Okay. Um, So I grew up at Faith Baptist Church in Wildemar um, from about 10, 11 on, really not sure what exact age I was there. Um, My mom was married to her third husband, who I was about 10 when they got married. And I remember her asking us and um, asking me and my sister what we thought about her getting married again. And we both laughed and said, why? They're just going to get another divorce. Because at 10, having been through two divorces, that's what we thought happened, right? So you really didn't have a chance to be our dad. Um, And then shortly after they got married, maybe a month or so, he, he had hid that he was an alcoholic. So then we started living that life every weekend. He'd come home drunk. And so he was never, I was never going to let him be a father. Um, So just to put into context, I didn't come from a happy home. Like we had a lot of problems in our home. We, we lived the church life. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all the activities. We eventually went to school there, but we were two different. We were we were one way at church and a different way at home, but I'll go back into that in a minute. Two and a half years ago, um, I got a call. Hold on. Let me back up for a minute. I'm trying to get on track here. My sister and brother-in-law, my brother-in-law, Victor Montero, was the youth pastor at the church I grew up in, Faith Baptist Church in Wildmar. Um, two and a half years ago, I got a call from a friend saying that one of his victims wanted to speak to me and the story had just come out. So in the very last week in March and the very first week in April, that week, um, we moved, my husband and I and our four kids moved to Montana. We lived in Southern California our whole lives. We moved to Montana. Um, best decision we ever made by the way, but, um, it, the timeline is interesting because We get here in April, in May, accusations come out about my brother-in-law that apparently were told to Pastor Goddard in November, but publicly they came out in May. A youth pastor has been arrested in Wildemar. Detectives say he sexually assaulted several children over a nearly 20 year period. Authorities arrested 45 year old Victor Montiero 
after what they're calling an extensive investigation into allegations he abused multiple children between 1999 and last year. At that month is when I got a call from a friend saying that one of the victims wanted to speak to me. And I didn't really know why, except that I thought maybe she knew that I had been through the same thing as a teenager. So I thought, well, okay. So I actually, I called my sister and I said, hey, so-and-so wants to talk to me about this. What do you think? And she's like, go ahead, you can talk to her. And I said, well, I really don't know what she wants other than maybe she knows my story. So a handful of people knew my story. So um, I, she was like, yeah, go ahead. I don't care, you know? So I just was kind of wanting to do what was best for my sister at the time because she had just found out that her husband was accused of um, sexually abusing minors and they were ultimately going to be getting a divorce and so I just felt like I needed to make that call and just check with her and she was like fine just just call so I called this person and we were talking and I said well I you know I don't know what I I don't know how I can help you what do you need from me and she said well I want you to talk to my attorney and I'm like what why and she said well you know, Victor used your story to keep us quiet. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? He had used the cover up of my story to keep his victims quiet. In that moment, I, I can't even describe the emotions, but it was like being re traumatized in that moment. I couldn't believe, especially for Victor being my brother-in-law knowing what i went through during that whole time that he would then use that to to do the same thing to other girls i i mean my mind was blown um so i said well let me think about it i talked to my sister again i said hey she wants me to talk to her attorney and she's like look you you have to do what you got to do whatever you think you need to do do it this is has nothing to do with me and the kids you guys do what you gotta do i said okay so I thought about it and I thought, you know what, I'll do it. I'll talk to her attorney. So I talked to her attorney and I was really frustrated at the time that all these years later, that trauma that I had been through was being used to hurt more, more girls. That was the big thing for me. So I talked to um, her attorney who ultimately became my attorney. <laughs> But I talked to them and just basically told my story. And the one thing that I was told by that, you know, doing that was, you know, you're not his first victim, meaning Paul Fox, because it was my story we were talking about. And I kind of had that feeling, but I had never had anyone point blank say that. And I said, why, why do you think that? And he's like, he, he was too systematic in his grooming of you. And so I thought that was interesting, um, but ultimately he asked me what I would want. If, if we sue on your behalf, do you want the pastor fired? Do you want money? Do you want an apology? Well, I had just left the IFB and actually I hadn't left it yet because we found an IFB church when we first moved to Montana. Um, up until moving to Montana, we went to Faith Baptist in Wildemar still. I was 42 years old, 43 years old, and we still went to Faith Baptist in Wildemar. We were raising our kids that way. Not totally, but we went to church there. And so my first thought was, I can't sue a church. I'm going to get struck by lightning. You know, <laughs> God's going to come after me. So I'm like, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to sue. And he's like, I'm like, first of all, if you sue for money, that's tainted money. That's God's money you're taking. Can't do that. If you're, um, if you sue for an apology, it's not an apology. It's because you're forcing it, right? And if he's going to be a pastor or not be a pastor, it's not up to me. That's between him and God. So I flat out said no. And I didn't want to tell my story because to be honest, it had been 27 years. I did not want to talk about it. I didn't want to go into it. I wanted it to go away. It wasn't something I was trying to drag back up in my life. But um, in June, we were uh, already scheduled to go to California for two weeks, just wrapping up things from our move. And we were staying with my mom 
and my stepdad. And so when we got down there, we, we got in really late, um, got to her house, uh, probably at like one in the morning. And so that morning I had been scheduled to talk to, um, one of their attorneys at the law firm just to get my entire story officially like on paper or whatever or recording however they did it and so i had talked to my mom one of the other things well i'll go back to that so i had talked to my mom that morning when, when we woke up which was like nine or ten in the morning um and she asked you know she, we were she was just filling me in on what was going on with victor and the investigation and my sister and then I had told her, she, I forget what she said to me, but I said, well, this is what's going on with me. I've talked to their attorney and um, they've, they, I told them my story. I'm, I'm doing it officially actually later today. And she said, well, why are you involved in this? And I said, mom, Victor used the cover up of my story to keep his victims quiet. And she was shocked. She was like, what? I said, yeah, I didn't know this. I was told this by one of the victims. Anyway, she said, well, I'm having lunch with Mrs. Goddard later, Bruce Goddard's wife. I said, okay. She said, she's been calling me a lot and wanting to talk because mm -hmm. I haven't been at church for like a month. And so, you know, do you care if I tell her? I'm like, I don't care what you tell her. <laughs> so uh, she went to lunch with her. She told her, she ended up telling her, I guess what happened, this is what my mom said, that Tammy Goddard brought up, you know, Kathy's story may come out in this. And she said, well, it already has. And she's already talked to their attorneys. So she goes home and she tells Bruce Goddard. At this point in time, every Sunday night, pretty much, um, Bruce Goddard is having a meeting after church where either he stands in the pulpit when, when church is over and gives an update on the investigation or this particular night which i think it's kind of crazy he did a really short sermon and didn't even have an altar call which is like unheard of i don't know in the 30 some odd years i was at that church if i ever saw him not do an altar call but he dismissed and said anyone that has a teenager in the youth group has ever had a teenager in the youth group is a youth worker or anyone that just wants to go up to the Spanish chapel. And of course I was not there. So I'm this is all secondhand information, mm. but he gets up there and he says 28 years ago. So the timing was a little wrong. He says 28 years ago, a teenager had an affair or an inappropriate relationship. I don't remember exactly how he worded it, but he didn't say abuse. Um, with us, I think he said a youth worker or the youth pastor, which he never was. Paul Fox was never the youth pastor, but, um, but we, he goes on to say that we handled everything correctly. We notified law enforcement, blah, 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 blah. That Wednesday, that was Sunday night. That Wednesday, while we were still in California, I had lunch with one of my friends whose husband is now on staff at Faith Baptist Church. <laughs> this, I feel like there's a lot of inbreeding in, this, right, right. in these stories, you know? Um, so we had lunch and I was talking to her and saying, I just can't believe this. I can't believe what's going on. I can't believe Victor. I can't believe he used my story. Like the whole thing was just so surreal. And she said, well, you know, the only thing that's that everyone's hearing is coming out of Pastor Goddard's mouth. And I said, because I was really upset that people were believing certain things and, and her take on it was that anything they're hearing is only coming from him because you know right everybody's pretty much off of social media because he has them do that um in that moment i said now keep in mind i had already talked to the attorneys and one of the things they had said was we will help you get your story out if you want to tell your story well i wasn't interested in anything that they wanted to help me with i didn't want to sue i didn't want to tell my story nothing but in that moment this was five, four days, five days after talking to the attorneys and hearing all this, I said, I need to tell my story. And I kind of said it sort of quietly to myself. And then I said it again, I need to tell my story. I need to put my story out there in my own words. And she said, yes, you do. You should tell your story. 
which I think it's so ironic because her husband was getting ready to go on staff and we're friends and she's telling me I should tell my story, which I think is so weird because it's done nothing but hurt that church. But um, I really, in that moment, when I said that out loud, I need to tell my story. I had total peace. I had been kind of wavering on what to do with this whole, all this information and what was happening. And when I said that, I knew it was what I needed to do. So I got a hold of the attorneys and said, I want to do my story. I kind of just, I felt like this trauma that I had been through was being used to hurt other girls. I need to take back control of my story and get it out there so it can't ever be used to hurt anyone else again. And that was my big push. And then, then on top of that, and that's what I was kind of wavering on, but on top of that, Goddard's there telling everybody he did everything right when he didn't. So I thought, this is crazy. He's lying about how this happened. So I just knew the conclusion was to tell my story in my own words. So I did that. And that kind of is where I'm going to go back and tell my story now, because right. I feel like in context, it had to make sense that I didn't just pop up 27 years later and say, yeah. hey, I have the story to tell. Well, that was, I mean, that was the big thing that I hope people kind of take away from this point is just, you know, one of the most common thing, even people who say, okay, yeah, I'm definitely against abuse. I think when it happens, you know, it should be reported. Those same people will, and I think anyone who doesn't, who hasn't spent time looking into this or, or studying this or talking with people, it's common to say, well, why come out 28 years later, 30 years later, you know, 40 years later, you know, is it just because they, you know, fill in the blank, wanted attention, needed money, needed this, or wanted to, you know, wanted to just, like you said, drag up all these old stories about someone. And that's, I mean, that's point zero, 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 one percent of these stories that the amount of, and you just explained it, like the amount of trauma from reaccessing these stories and for having to talk about it. And it's not a highlight or, you know, it's, people aren't telling their stories because they're bored. It comes to a point where they absolutely need to tell their story. And in most cases are like yours, where mo most survivors that I've talked to seem to want to just, okay, it happened. I'm going to move forward with my life. And it's when they realize that it affected somebody else that they tend to come forward. That's pretty much everyone I've talked to has come forward after a long period of time has been, I found out they had another victim or I found out your, your case, I mean, this was what shocked me with, with Rachel's story was when she told me that, um, that over the phone, Victor had said, you know, well, you know, pastor's not going to do anything in reference to your story. Right. Um, it's just a next level of just heinousness to an already heinous situation. But, um, but yeah, I appreciate you kind of giving that backstory because it, I hope that really answers a question for some who listen, who might still be sitting there going like, well, why wait? And, you know, uh, on the surface, I get where the question comes from, but then when you start really thinking about how human beings address trauma in general, like it seems like, I mean, to come out after 20 years probably feels like it's coming out a few days later. I mean, the, I can't imagine. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, There's no claim to fame on being right, abused. Right. I mean, trauma, it lives with you forever. I've learned a lot about trauma and healing and how it affects the body in the last two years. Yeah. Um, I think people are ready to tell their story at different times. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of courage to talk about it, but my big push was that it was being used to hurt more girls. And I know the pain and the trauma I went through. Mm -hmm. I was not going to cry during this. <laughs> um, whew. Look, I'm 45 and I still cry. It's that painful. But definitely what hurt me more was that Victor used the cover up to hurt other girls. And I knew the only way to stop my story from being used was to tell it in my own words, to get it out there so nobody can twist it and make it what it's not 
and use it to harm mm. anyone else. But on the other hand, I also needed to enact change because this is enough. It's too much, but like, how, how long are we going to keep letting this go on? Mm. So I'm going to go back and tell my story at this point. So people will know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> um, so as a teenager at Faith Baptist Wildemar, um, my family was very involved in church. It was me, my sister and a stepbrother and my mom and my stepdad. And we all went to church every time the doors were open. We went to the Christian school there. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with the IFB now, as far as anyone that, that listens to this, but just to recap, it's, you don't question authority. You do what you're told with a good attitude, no matter what you're asked. We literally have written down, actually um, a team, a youth camp uh, book from about five years ago that I have um, one of the rules on there is, the adult is always right, even when they're wrong. And it literally says that the adults are always right, even when they're wrong. You're not allowed to question adults. You do what you're told. So when you grow up in this environment like that, you don't feel like you have a voice. And I already knew I didn't have a voice because I went in the girl's home <laughs> because I didn't do anything wrong. And I was in a year, I spent a year in this girl's home. So I already felt felt powerless, but I also felt like I didn't have anyone on my side. I didn't have a parent that loved me or cared how I felt. There was no, I love yous in our house. There were no hugs. I had grandparents that were unbelievably amazing that loved me unconditionally, but we were only allowed to see them sporadically. And that was something my, I felt like my mom always held over my head was, well, you won't be able to see your grandparents. Um, we did sometimes see them weekly, but then sometimes we would go months without seeing them. And it was just kind of ebbed and flowed. So I'm a teenager going to church seven days a week, Christian school activities and living with turmoil in our home because my parents didn't get along. Um, there was a lot of problems and feeling very alone. Like no one was on my side. No one was for me. There was not one person I could go to. So I was like the perfect victim because I had daddy issues. I didn't really belong to anyone. I didn't feel like I could lean on anyone. I think a big mistake that churches make is not talking about grooming or um, inappropriate touch. Now, I think it's interesting with our church that we grew up in and the, the so enforced rules, never be alone with a member of the opposite sex. That was for married people and unmarried people. You should never be in a position where anyone questions your motivation or what you're doing. So you, you couldn't be in a room with a member of the opposite sex. You couldn't be in a car. And yet I did that all the time and people saw it and never said anything. So it's similar to Victor where he was the exception. Paul Fox was the exception. And I'm going to call him Paul Fox. His name is Laverne Paul Fox, but he always went by Paul Fox. He never went by Laverne. Um, so the Foxes were hired at our church. He was hired to be the bus director. So um, he this, had that dynamic. Sorry, ahead. and this was around what year? Around 1990. Um. So it was him and his wife and they had two little boys, like first and third grade. They were hired from Hiles Anderson. They were originally from Pennsylvania. So they went to Hiles Anderson, graduated, and now they came and worked out in California at our church. Shock. Right? <laughs> um, and at that time, I mean, we're talking the 90s. Everyone was hired from Hiles Anderson. Our pastor went to Hiles Anderson. That's where everyone who left our church to go to Bible college went. It was the only Bible college at that time. It wasn't, but in our realm, it was, you went right. to Hiles Anderson. So the Foxes were hired to come to our church. He was going to be the bus director, but he had that kind of dynamic outgoing personality, similar to Scop and Victor, which again, I find interesting that all these men have these dynamic personalities. Right. Um, so he started working in our youth group because teens kind of were attracted to him. 
uh, I ended up babysitting for them. And it's kind of weird. I don't know. Maybe it's not weird, but certain teenagers babysat for certain families all the time. They were kind of like their go-to babysitter. So certain teenage girls kind of were attached to different families. I started babysitting for them and they didn't have family or anyone out in California. So they kind of got close to my family. I mean, they would come to different um, holiday dinners. They would come over. Plus we were all in the youth group. So there was just a lot of interaction with their, with them and my family. Um, I got to know them really well. I was close to both of them. I was equally close to Lorraine as I was to Paul. Um, they became like my surrogate parents. They called me the daughter I didn't, they never had because they had two boys. I called them the parents I always wanted. Um, they bought me dresses and just different things. Like I had this set of quote unquote parents that I thought were amazing. I did not have parents I were close to in my home. Um, but I babysat for them quite a bit. I saw him, I saw them both pretty much seven days a week, not always Lorraine, but definitely Paul, because he was, he was at the church. I was in the bus ministry at, at the church. He was over the bus ministry. So Sunday morning, Sunday night, I would see them Monday through Friday. I was at the church. So I would see him sporadically Wednesday nights. I would see him, um, and her, um, Saturday mornings was a bus meeting and I would see, uh, him cause he led the bus meetings. So I spent a lot of time with this, this couple on top of babysitting for them. Um, so I didn't realize really, I, I couldn't put my finger on when the grooming started. I think for him, it started when I started babysitting for them. I think it, I think the grooming started for him before I knew, obviously I didn't know grooming had started, but looking back, I can't even put a finger on when the grooming started. I can tell you specific grooming activities, yeah. but as far as knowing when it started, I don't know because there was this change from me being like a daughter to them to something else for him. Right. Well, that, I mean, that's something when you said just the amount of gifts and buying dresses and things like that, like that's, that's something I'm, I was, I was listening to, I was trying to find, I have a stack of books right here, but I was trying to find, um, which book it was really talked about that, but, um, yeah, gifts are a huge part of that. And it's, it's often, and it's hard, right? I mean, there's people who are, you know, who do really act as second parents and they do step into that role, but also, you know, when there's people who, you know, are, or individuals who are heavily focused on building relationships with people who are children, when they don't have children of their own, especially, um, you have to be on the lookout for stuff like that. And um, yeah, so, so when you mentioned gifts, that's, a, that's something where, I mean, obviously, I don't know where his wife fit into that. I mean, she could have been purely intentioned with, with, you know, spoiling and, and things like that. But but yeah, definitely for a lot of grooming, one of the first things is giving gifts, taking on trips, you know, driving off to practices, like all of that kind of stuff. So yeah. that triggered a big, big red flag in my mind for sure. Yeah. And for the most part, all the gifts came from both of them. Right. Um, in fact, a lot of times she was the one giving them to me. Mm. Um, but then, you know, like they gave me a dress one time and every time I wore it, he made sure to say something about it. Right. And, and it started off with, you look so nice in that dress. I'm glad that dress fits you so well, you know, like things that I wouldn't pick up on being weird. Well, and it's not always weird. So it's, it's right. that line of like, you're never going to go tell someone like, Oh, he keeps complimenting my dress, you know, right. you're not kind of yeah. all that stuff yeah. out. So one of the things that, um, happens at least in our youth group, we had a really, really big youth group. We had a great youth group. Um, we had a lot of activities. We went teen soul winning once a week, and then we had usually an activity Friday or Saturday. Well, a lot of kids didn't have rides. And Wildemar is a little town at the end of Lake Elsinore. So most of our people came from Lake Elsinore. 
Well, Lake Elsinore has a big lake, as its name implies, and the city is kind of built all around the lake. So if you were going to drop people off after church or after teen activity, you had to make the trek all the way around the lake. Now I'm guessing you could probably get around it in an hour, um, dropping people off, but eventually I started going, I don't, I don't even know how this happened, but eventually I started going with him in the van to drop everybody off. And usually the girls are not the last ones dropped off if it's a male adult dropping kids off right because a man is not supposed to be alone with a girl vice versa if it was ladies dropping them off it, they drop off the teen boys first they just would make sure that a opposite sex was not the last one in the van but lots of times i was the last one in the van and we we lived in wildemar so if you went all the way around the lake, you would end up back in Wildemar. So he would just make sure he went around the lake in, an, in a way that I was the last one dropped off, if that makes sense. And he would even go out of his way to drop people off and then go back and drop me off. So we just had a lot of time together. We had a lot of time to talk and it just became familiar. It wasn't, even though there was a rule about it, it, it wasn't uncomfortable at all because I had I was really close to them. He was like a father figure to me. So we would just talk. And this went on for a while. I don't know how long. Um, you know, babysitting for them, being in school every day at the church and him being around, being in the bus ministry. Like I was just with them all the time, whether it was just him or him and her. So it was super comfortable. There were no red flags for me. I was 14 years old. So, you know, I guess there wouldn't be red flags anyway, especially growing up in that. Right. I did know there were rules being broken, I think, as far as like being together alone. But I kind of just felt like, and I knew other adults knew that. So I kind of just felt like they understood our relationship, that we had kind of this father-daughter relationship. And that's why it wasn't wrong to anyone else either, because obviously that was not part of the rules. You could be alone with your child, right? Um, I went to teen camp one time and we had two camps a year. We had summer camp that was a week and we had winter camp. And I went to, I went to camp, I don't remember which one it was. Um, and one of my good friends, there was four of us that were best friends she brought her teddy bear with her and she had spent the night at my house before and brought her teddy bear and so i i mentioned to her i'm like why do you bring that bear everywhere you go and she said well my dad gave it to me and it was like an instant knife to the heart i just thought wow i will never have that i was kind of making fun mm -hmm. of her until she said that and then when she said that it just hurt you know i'll never have that um so we sometime after that a week or two I was alone with him, with Paul Fox. And one of the things we had been doing at some point, he would take me, and we were always in the church van. He would take me in the church van for a drive and we would talk and we would just talk. And um, I mentioned to him that about this teddy bear. And I just realized I will never have that. And he had me, so these big 15 passenger vans, they have the driver's seat and the passenger seat, and then there's a space in between. And so he had me, he said, come here, because he's in the driver's seat and I'm in the passenger seat. And I didn't know what he meant by come here. And he's like, scoot over. And so I, I edged to the seat that I was in, the passenger seat, and I turned towards him and he just hugged me. And it felt really good. It was like I was getting a hug from my dad. I, we were talking about, I'll never have this bear. I'll never have something my dad gave me. And he hugged me. And I remember how good it felt. And then that very next week, during that next week, um, he had told me sometime during the day to meet him at the end of the buses. And so I went down there after school, I went down and met him at the end of the buses and he was in his car. And so I got in his car and I was in the back seat, 
And he said, I have something for you. And I said, okay. And he said, there's a bag on the floor. And I opened the bag and it was a big bag. It was a Kmart bag. Um, and I pulled out this teddy bear and I felt like I was five years old and just got this teddy bear from my dad. I was clinging to this bear. And it seemed like a very long time, I have maybe been a minute or two, I don't even know, but it seemed like it was a long time because I was just in this moment. And I, and it was the moment I thought he really does love me like a dad would love his daughter because he heard what I said. He heard how hurt I was over it. And he gave me this bear. He's fulfilling this need that I didn't even know I had until the week before. And then he said, there's something else in the bag. And I was excited. I'm like, wow, Christmas, right? So I dig in the bag and I pulled out the skimpiest pair of panties I had ever seen in my life. Had there been thongs back there, this would have been one. I was so embarrassed. I shoved them back in the bag. I said something about, I, I think those are for your wife. Like I, I was so confused. I wanted so desperately to cling to this moment being a little girl with this bear. And then he throws this in there and it was so confusing in my brain. I was just, I didn't even know how to respond. I wanted to be stuck with this bear. I wanted that to go away. I don't know what that meant or what that was for, but wow. It was just, it was so overwhelming to me. Um, so I took the bag with the bear, went home and I was trying to just kind of ignore the bag and what was in it. And I babysat for them sometime during that week. And he asked me, he just came up behind me and said, are you wearing them? And I didn't even look at him. I just was like, no, like, I, I was so shocked and embarrassed. I didn't even know how to respond, but I said, no, they went on wherever they were going. I babysat. Um, he almost every time I saw him, he would ask me either if I've worn them or if I was wearing them. And at that point, you know, the, it's like when you're a child, the first time you hear the word sex, you're like, Oh, and you're all embarrassed and like, right. oh my God. And then you hear it again and it's a little less shocking. And every time you hear it, it's less shocking. Well, the more he asked me, the more, the less embarrassed I got. And I would always say, no, no, no. But it, it wasn't so embarrassing to say no anymore. It was like a topic that was not off limits anymore. Um, one of the things he did, and by this time, we were still, we would still go on these random drives. I was still the last teenager dropped off if there was an activity and we just did a lot of talking. He was hugging me a lot more then. Um, at one point he kissed me on my forehead and I wasn't shocked. I mean, it felt very much like a dad would kiss his daughter on the forehead. Even though this whole situation with the bear and the underwear had happened, it still, I clung to this comfort of having a father figure. Um, he listened to me and I felt like nobody listened to me then you, you couldn't do a lot of talking anyway, because if you were talking about anything bad, it was gossip. So you weren't allowed to really, I would say it wasn't an environment in which you were free to tell your feelings. You weren't supposed to be depressed. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so at, at some point I babysat for him and I think he, I think I'm not sure which came first, the book or this kiss, but at some point, the kiss on the forehead was a kiss on the cheek, and then it landed on my mouth. And over time, we were eventually making out. Um, and this was about what age? 14, 15. Okay. So this was had, all over the course of, I mean, obviously, him like jumping to this is very quick. Yeah, um, but, it but, went from zero to 360 fast. Like it, it was not a slow grooming process. Like less, I would, less, less than a year for sure. I would say less than three months. Okay. Wow. Um, it always made me uncomfortable when he was around our family, like when, when their family would come over and we had kissed or whatever, it, it would, it made me uncomfortable, but he seemed so normal with it. 
that I almost like was like, well, maybe this isn't as bad as I think this is, or like you almost felt like maybe you were the one that was making it weird. It was yeah, because exactly. he was so normal about it. Right. And it wasn't it was the weird relationship anyway. He wasn't my dad, but he was very much like my dad. And she was very much like my mom. Um did you uh, not to not to stop you in the middle of your story, but did you like you said, you felt it was a little bit weird at, at initially, and you know you had like that close relationship with her. Did you ever feel like, oh, is this betraying her, or is he hurting her somehow? Like, did you have any of those thoughts, or no, just... I didn't until we started having sex. But I'll get there. Um, one night, I was going to spend the night at their house because they were going to some church activity, and they, they were going to get back really, really late. And so I went to their house and I would usually go like right after school because this was before I could drive. So it was most convenient for me to just go home with him. And so I went home with him. And I think that again is part of why I'm like, why didn't anyone think that was weird yeah. that I'm driving in the car alone with him? And I think that's also why it wasn't weird for me to go meet him at the end of the buses in his car because people knew we drove alone. But they knew we had this father. I was like their daughter. So I, I in, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking everybody thinks, everybody knows I'm kind of like their daughter. And that's why, and this is from me looking back on the situation. When yeah. I think, why didn't anyone say anything? We were breaking all of these very written and spoken word um, rules. Why didn't anyone, why didn't the adults around me say anything? Well, I think it's because they knew we had this relationship. Like I was mm -hmm. like their daughter. So it wasn't weird. Um, but I drove home with him and they were getting ready and then they left and then he came back in and he grabbed a book off the bookshelf and he said, read this after the boys go to bed. And I said, okay. And they left and it was called the act of marriage. It's a book that at Hiles Anderson, once you got engaged, you were given this book and it's exactly what it says it is. It's, the act of sex it's how to have sex it's very detailed what sex is and how to have it um you know you have to remember that i'm not talking 14 years old today we didn't have cell phones we didn't have the internet readily available um so and we weren't growing up in the ifb where you didn't watch movies or talk sex ed there was none of that so I was pretty naive and I had been sexually, I had been molested younger than that, but I had never had sex and I didn't know anything. Um, so I read this book and I'm just like grossed out by the whole thing thinking this is crazy. And then things progressed really quickly after that. Um, we ended up having sex. I remember the first time I was bleeding and it freaked me out. And I told him like, oh my God, I'm bleeding. He's like, it's normal. He was like instantly cold from the minute we had sex. He changed to this different person, but he could tell when I was getting standoffish, like I, I kind of had enough. And he would reel me back in with something. He'd be super comforting. He would talk to me like he loved me. He would buy me something. And then he would just ramp up to being cold and cocky again. Right. But this was at least once a week, sometimes twice. We would go off in the church van. It was always in the church van, um, which is so totally gross that it was in the church van because every time I got in that church van to go anywhere, in any activity it was just weird because all i could think of what is what happened in that van um so i'm trying to think of where to go from here so this goes on right um he ended up working in the christian school he ended up he was kind of working in there a little bit when my sister and my stepbrother graduated in 91 because, and I don't remember exactly what he was doing there, but he's in their senior class picture with Carl Hammonds, who also spent time in jail for abusing teenage girls. Um, but then Carl Hammonds left suddenly 
and he took over the school and my sister and my stepbrother had gone to bible college so that year that was 19 that was the fall of 1991. paul fox took over the school yes he okay. became the principal so he had worked in the school in the spring of 91 because he was in that senior picture but i don't really remember much of him being in the school so i'm not sure how much i was privy to that i, I just don't remember i think but then that 1991 year he did take over being the principal of the school and um then my we did ace school so we did paces and my desk so we all faced the wall we had these desks that sat along the wall we faced the wall we had these dividers and my desk faced into his office there was a big window that separated three desks from his office and my desk was directly in front of his window when i got done with my schoolwork i would go help in his office we could help in whatever the school office or his office and um he always had me help in his office so i was with him a lot in there he would close the door he would do things he would touch me in school with that window there and it was a big window it's not a tiny little window and it's a big window into the main classroom and it was almost as if he just wanted to see if he could get away with it kind of thing um he did my driver's ed I had to do driver's ed and at that time you just needed someone to drive with you for so many hours so he did all of my driver's ed training which how this didn't break a school rule well it did break a school rule but how it was allowed just blows my mind right you have all these rules and yet he's allowed to do all my driver driver's ed with just me alone in the car with him well a lot of those driver's ed hours were not driving I'll just say that. <laughs> um, at some point in the in, so this goes on, same type of behavior. Um, in March of 1992, I was 16 then. Um, oh, one other incident on my 16th birthday, we had or right near that, I don't know if that was the same day, but I had turned 16. Um, we went on the bus route, it was a Sunday. And then we, in the in the double wide trailer with these two offices, that was our Christian school, was also where we had the bus ministry meeting on Saturday morning. After the buses, we came back. He had driven my bus that day, the bus I worked on. And we went into the office because he said he had a present for me. So we went into the office and he gave me a present. It was a Bible. Okay, so I opened this Bible and he's sitting on the desk with his legs spread apart and I'm standing in between his legs and he's kissing me. And in walks one of the teen workers, an adult lady who she had kids that were, that were out of the youth group and then kids that were in the youth group. And she walks in and we instantly jump apart. And yet nothing is ever said about it. Mm. She doesn't ask why we're in there. There's nobody on the church property, but me and him and her. Now the pastor did work, did live on the pastor Goddard did live on the church property, but it was away from the church buildings. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Does he, does he still or no? No, okay. no. This was on cat road in Wildemar okay. was when we were still in the tent. Got it. Um, so there was just a lot of, when I look back on the whole situation, there was a lot of people that saw or knew what was going on and never said anything. And I think that there's some accountability there. Like if you're a youth worker and you see something that doesn't look right, you need to speak up. It's probably not right. Yeah. And I, I feel like there's, I don't know why that people are hesitant to say something. You don't even have to make it like an accusation. You can just say, hey, this doesn't look right, or what's going on, or are you okay? Like by this point, and, and very early on, and we're talking 1992, but even 91, he was mean. He was cold, he was cocky. And a lot of, and some people in our church, a lot of people were drawn to him because he had that dynamic personality, but there were people that were turned off by him because he was so cocky. And I was done 
like in 91. Like I didn't need a dad anymore. That's how mean he was. But he would reel me back in with giving me what he thought I needed so that I, I don't know if he was trying to keep me quiet or what. But in March of 1992, we went to pastor school. Now at our church, you know, pastor school is a big deal going to Hammond to pastor school. Dr. Hiles was still alive then. Um, but it was the pastors, the youth workers, like, like workers in the church. Teenagers didn't typically go to pastor school, but I went to pastor school with the foxes. And which is really weird. Like I look back at that and go, how did that happen? My mom kept their boys. Like, like how did it happen that a teenager went to pastor school? I mean, there was probably a group of 20 to 30 people from our church that went and I was the only teenager. It's just, it's just weird. I look back and at all the weird things that happened, like how, how did this happen? But I went to pastor school with them, um, with our whole group. And we would be sitting in a service and he would either from sitting behind me or next to me or whatever, say, leave and go to the van in five minutes. And so I would wait five minutes and I would leave the service and go to the van. And then he would leave the service and go to the van. And then we would leave and he would, he took me to a park and we had sex. He took me just in the van. We had sex. Um, I don't know how all people in our group and you always sat together at pastor school because your group sat together. How did people not see that we both left? I, I, I just don't understand how, how this was allowed to happen for so long. It makes no sense in my mind with all the rules they have how that wasn't so very obvious. I mean, his wife was sitting there. She didn't wonder where he went and where I went. Like, it just blows my mind. But um, one of the things we did there is they were good friends with Daryl Moore. Daryl Moore was the um, president of the, or the dean of the evening college at Hiles Anderson. And so we went to his house one day, Paul, Fox, Lorraine Fox, and myself during pastor school, went to his house, met him and his wife. Um, they were just visiting, but I was with them. So I went with them, um, which is interesting in my story later, but I met Daryl Moore. Then at the end of pastor school, Lorraine was not happy with being in California. I don't know if it was, she didn't like our church. I don't know what the situation was, but she didn't like being there anymore. If she was homesick, I don't know, just wasn't for her. So she had kind of stopped going to church a lot. She would come Sunday morning and I think Sunday night, and Wednesday night, but she didn't, she wasn't involved in activities. She would leave right after and her pulling away from the church kind of left me and him close and her not close to me. Because at some point during that time, I was told I shouldn't be around her. And that was Pastor Goddard telling me that. Like, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be hanging around. You shouldn't be going to the Foxes right now. Um, you know, you just need to not go over there. And like, it was just weird. And then, um, so at the end of pastor school, but I was so close to her. At the end of pastor school, they decided they were going to stay for a week. And just, I don't know what they were doing. I don't know in my mind at that age, what I thought they were doing. I was 16, but I knew that there was something going on. I knew there was some bad reason why they weren't coming back with the whole group. And um, so I just remember he took me aside and I was crying and he said, just go home and take care of our boys. Um, we'll be back in a week. And so, I went home with the group and they stayed and um, he had told me several things about their marriage during our talks and our drives to La Cresta. We, we'd go to La Cresta most often in the van, which is a little town above Wildemar. It's like a little, um, well, La Cresta is like where there's like big estate homes and they have acreage up there, yeah. but there's also like an area where you can go on hiking trails and stuff. So we would go up there a lot. Um, 
which is weird too, because why did no one ever wonder why this church van always appeared there parked, you know? Uh, but when he came, when they came back from pastor school, um, things were a little different. He was more cocky and more cold, but more needy. It was really weird. It was, it was at 16. I didn't know what was going on because I didn't understand adult relationships, obviously. Um, he had told me at one point that if his wife knew about all the college girls he had been with at Hiles, she would have divorced him a long time ago. And there was just some transition that took place there. And I don't know what it was, but something happened that week they were gone. Um, our visits became more frequent. Like I went with him more, we went on more drives, we had sex more. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened between their marriage. I'm not sure. They stayed together for a very long time after they left. So it, it's, I don't know what happened, but anyway, it was just something changed during that time. And this was in March. And so in, on May, in May, May 24th, I was 17. I turned 17. So May My, 24th of 03? 92. 92. You're way ahead, Eric. We're not in the 2000s yet. <laughs> Oh, sorry, this is I meant 92. 93. That's what I was saying. But um, so this yeah, is no, 92. So this is all within the course of less than two years still. Yes. Okay. So um I turned 17. My sister and stepbrother came home from Bible college, and we had a week of school left before we would get out um for the summer. And our teen soul winning at that time was Tuesday nights. So Tuesday night, I went teen soul winning. Now I could drive now because I had, I could drive for the last year. Um, and I drove to, I don't know, maybe I didn't drive. Somehow I went to teen soul winning because he brought me home in the van. So I don't know, maybe I didn't drive, but I went teen soul winning. And then later that night, he dropped me off in the church van. And, um, it was sometime after that pastor school that is when I was told not to be going to their house and not to be hanging out with them. Um, but I wasn't really given a reason why I kind of had a feeling I knew why it was something to do with her. But, um, so I, I went teen soul winning or I said I was going teen soul winning and I got dropped off by him in the church van. It was a Tuesday night. And my mom asked, where were you? And I said, I went soul winning. And she's like, no, you weren't. And I'm like, yeah, I did. And she said, they had a college activity and Crystal and Pat didn't see you at the church. So I kind of knew in that moment that, oh crap, you know, like maybe I had been caught, but she didn't say anything. She didn't say anything else. So I went to school the next day. We went to church Wednesday night and then everybody was leaving and we weren't leaving. Like I couldn't find my mom to leave. And I thought that was weird. And then she came up and I said, are we going? And she said, Pastor Goddard wants to talk to you. And I said, okay. Now, to put in context of who I was at this church, Pastor Goddard at one time had a singing group of teenage girls that he would take and travel with them. I was in that group. Hmm. I was a good girl. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I mean, obviously. I was having this relationship where I was being abused, but as far as everyone knew, I babysat for different couples in the, the church. I did what I was told. I showed up when I was supposed to show up. I went to school. I, I was a good kid. I go into pastor Goddard's office. He comes, he comes and gets me. We go in and he's just making chit chat. Like, how was your day? How's school? Are you ready for summer? Like just normal. I don't remember exactly what he said, but it was very normal, just easy conversation. And I thought, well, maybe he doesn't know, but by this time, this had been going on for a very long time and I was done. I had been close to trying to end it several times, but he just kind of knew how to pull me back in, right. whether it was just listening to me more or being more compassionate, but then he would just build up to being cold and cocky again. And so I had already been on the verge of trying to end this when this happened, when we got caught. And I was kind of relieved that we had gotten caught, or at least I thought we had gotten caught. So 
I go into Pastor Goddard's office and we're sitting there and he, we're making small talk, like he's just chit chat. And then he says, where were you last night? And I just remember it took me a really long time to come up with the answer. And I was fighting in my head, like, what do I say? Do I say, is this all winning? Do I say I was with him? Like what? But something inside me knew that this was my moment to have this be done. This was my out. I don't know why I'm crying right now. <sighs> I knew that in this moment, in this small little window, I could be done with this. This could all stop. And so I said, I was with Brother Fox. And he said, he looked up at me kind of confused and he said, oh, you were at the Foxes? And I kind of was taken aback a little bit like, oh, he doesn't know. Because I thought at the same time, I thought, well, maybe he knows, but then he was being really nice. You I thought, thought he was like leading know. you to that, but. Yeah, but then he seemed so surprised that I thought, oh, well, he doesn't know. And I said, and it, it seemed like it took a really long time for him to formulate a question and it took me a really long time to formulate an answer. So there was a lot of dead space in this conversation. And his office was like a closet. It was a there was a two car garage with a little office on the end of it. And that was his office. And so, I mean, like it was teeny tiny. So it was a claustrophobic kind of weird. Yeah. Situation. Like he was right there and I was, I could feel him like staring me down, waiting for an answer. And I'm trying to come up with an answer. And I said, he said, Oh, you with the foxes. And I said, no. And then it took him a long time to say, you were with brother fox and i said yes and um then you could tell his demeanor changed like he was caught on to where we were going with this and i had decided this was it i was gonna tell i couldn't do this anymore and so i forget exactly you know like i mean it was 29 years ago now specific verbiage what exactly people said is kind of lost on me at this point but the gist is he asked me at some point he went out and he said he he went out to tell my mom to leave like this is going to be a while just go home and he That's comes back and thing. yeah i'm not sure what that was about but um my mom did say something to him. She told me, I don't know if this is true or not, because she likes to elaborate or <laughs> add things that aren't necessarily true. Um, she said that she told him she was going to go kill him. So I don't know if that's true or not, but there's a part later that might allude to that. Um, anyway, he comes back in and he says, I think he asked me, have you kissed? And I just, this, this slow process of him trying to formulate a question and then me equally slow trying to come up with an answer was killing me. Like it was, it just was taking too long. And I thought, oh my God, it, we got to get this over with. And I remember I said, oh yeah. And I said it that way on purpose. I wanted him to know that, look, dude, this goes way beyond kissing, like get to it already kind of thing. And so he said, have you kissed? And I said, oh yeah. And I don't remember much of the conversation after that. I just remember feeling so relieved that it was out. And there was a lot of phone calls that were gonna be made and just, there was just a lot of stuff going on. It was like an instant world of activity, I felt like. And it was weird because it was Wednesday night and almost everybody was had gone. Like no one was left at the church, this took hours. At some point he told me to, he had, he was going to have me go sit with Mrs. Goddard while he went and talked to my parents and the foxes. And I did not want to do that. I did not like her. She was, she has always been to me very cold and standoffish. Mm -hmm. She's not the friendliest person. And so I went and sat in their living room because it was on the church property and she came out in her bathrobe. And they had obviously talked and then he left 
And she laid into me like nothing I've ever heard before. She called me a harlot, a homewrecker. How could you do this? You've destroyed their marriage. And I mean, I'm crying. I am sobbing. And she is laying into me just, just continuously. And the only thing that keeps coming to my mind is, oh my God, why did you tell? Why did you tell? Oh my God, what did you do? Why did you tell? What is happening right now? This is not how this was supposed to happen. Like, I just instantly regretted my decision to tell. I went from, in a very short amount of time, I went from being completely relieved that I had finally told and it was going to stop to regretting that very decision because of what she was saying to me. I don't know how much time went by. It seems like hours, but I'm not sure. Um, Pastor Goddard came back to the house and I was never so thankful in my life to see his face because she could stop yelling at me. <laughs> um, he told me to come outside. My mom and my stepdad were there and my stepdad is a very deep voice and he almost sounds angry when he's just talking to you. And I remember distinctly him saying, get in the car. And I was just like, oh my God, I can't go with them. You know, I thought I was going to die. Um, Pastor Goddard said, you have to go home with your parents. And I'm like, I, I can't go with them. And he's like, no, you have to go home with them. Um, he's like, but I need to ask you one more thing. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, is there any chance you're pregnant? And I said, no, I had no idea. I honestly had no idea. I didn't know how you got pregnant. I, we didn't have sex ed. So I just said no, cause I was embarrassed and I went home with my parents. I went to bed that night. I was really sad because I wanted to call Paul and tell him why I told and that I had told. I didn't want him to be blindsided because I loved him like a father. Um, the next little bit of time is such a whirlwind because I was in trouble. I was punished. Um, I went to school the next day. I showed up at school and we did our normal morning stuff. And then I was told to go to Pastor Goddard's office. And so it was right outside the trailer of our school. You just walk down this little sidewalk and there's his office. There's the church office. But then next across from that was that garage with his office. And so I knocked on the door and he said, come in. And um, he told me to sit down and he, I think he asked, you know, are you okay? I don't remember exactly everything he asked. We talked for quite a while. I know one of the things I said was, I said, I want to talk to him. I felt this overwhelming need to explain what I had done. And he said, no, you have to treat this like a death. And I remember just thinking, what? Now, as an adult, I think he just wanted me to forget about him. Like he doesn't exist anymore, but I had never lost a family member at that time. So I didn't know what treat, treat it like a death meant. Um, he, a lot of phone calls were being made. Uh, he had called Dr. Hiles. He called Christian law association. Um, I assumed what I was going to say. So none to the police, I'm assuming at this point. Oh, no, no, never. So I, I kind of assumed that um, he was talking to David Gibbs because he's always the voice of Christian Law Association. That's always the name I'd heard associated with that. But he was actually, David Gibbs was out of town and mm -hmm. he was talking to Charlie Craze, who was his partner, I guess. Um, so one of the things that had happened that I didn't mention was when he left me with Mrs. Goddard, to go to my parents and talk to the foxes. He, meaning Bruce Goddard, called a person in our church that was in sort of law enforcement and um, told them to bring their badge, their gun, and their handcuffs and meet him at the church. There's a, a, a church member threatening another church member. And what that was, was my mom threatening to kill Paul Fox, right? So he took this man with him to talk to my parents and he left him. We lived up this long dirt road up at the top and he left him at the bottom of the dirt road and he went up 
and talked to them and came back down and said, everything's fine, you know, whatever. And which I think is so weird because this person was in border patrol. He wasn't like a police officer or what, you know what I mean? Like you're going to arrest like a white citizen. Like that makes no sense to me now, you know, looking back, I'm like, what? But anyway, I was sequestered in his office. I was not allowed to go to school. He would come in and talk to me for a while, like some counseling kind of thing. And then he would get a phone call and leave, or he would just leave for a while. He said, I was not allowed to talk about it with anyone. Um, at one point I asked him if I could go to the bathroom because I didn't even think I could leave to go to the bathroom. And I went out and school was on like recess or lunch break or whatever. And some of my friends were like, what's happening? Where are you? And I'm like, I can't talk about it. And I just remember I went straight to the bathroom and came back and I, I just, it was just like this whirlwind. Mrs. Goddard took me home that day after school. And she's trying to like chit chat and make small talk on the way home. And I'm thinking, you're crazy. You ripped my head off last night. I'm right. not talking to you. Like what? So I didn't talk to her, but she was trying to talk to me. And I got home and my, my sister and my stepbrother were home for co from college. So they were at home. And I had this list of chores that I had to do. And it was like, we lived on probably three quarters of an acre, maybe an acre. It was pretty big. Yeah. And I had to weed this hill that surrounds our house. Like it was huge. It would have taken me weeks. If I got done with that, I had to paint our tack barn for our horse. Um, it was just an endless list of work. Now, my mom said that she was trying to keep me busy because the foxes were moving out of town and she didn't want me contacting him, but I don't know. I felt very much like I was in trouble. There was no what happened? Are you okay? Do you need anything? There was none of that. One of those days, uh, there was a phone call and I think my mom answered, but I'm not sure. But then I was told to come to the phone and it was Charlie craze. And he said, um, he, he said who he was and he said, do you want to press charges? And I said, no, I love him. And he said, I said, but I want to talk to him. And he said, that's not going to happen. I just need to know if you want to press charges. And I said, no. And so then he talked to my mom and according to my mom, he said that, um, he asked if she was going to be pressing charges or something. And he said, um, she said, yes. And he said, well, just so you know, we won't be defending your daughter. We'll be defending Paul Fox. And she said, well, this did happen. You can ask Pastor Goddard. He's like, no, it's not about whether it happened or not. We just don't defend laymen. We defend church workers and pastors. And we are going to make your daughter look like she was the pursuer mm -hmm. and just so on and so forth. Now, I'm told today he could be disbarred for that conversation, but he's so old, he's no longer practicing. So it's kind of a mute point. Um, but there was no law enforcement contacted. There was no, um, nothing was done correctly. It was from the get go, a cover up by Bruce Goddard. And I'll get to the details of that in a minute. Um, I mean, just talking to the lawyer before you even had a chance to talk to police and them asking, are you going to press charges is skipping a massive step in the process. Well, and I was a minor. Right. So why are you asking me anyway? Right. <laughs> um, oh, he, one of the things Goddard did at that time was he called an emergency deacons meeting. And I, what he told us, what Goddard told us was that in this deacons meeting, he asked the deacons, he told them that a teenager and Paul Fox had had an inappropriate relationship. It was never called abuse. It was always a relationship. And um, I just need you guys to decide whether we call law enforcement or not. And the deacons decided, not unanimously, but they decided, no, they would not call law enforcement. And the reason he told me that, he said the reason for that is because if law enforcement comes here and starts an investigation, they can shut down our Christian school, they can close down the bus ministry. And he just made me feel so guilty of the possibility of those things happening 
Right. I didn't want those things to happen either. I mean, that was my school. My yeah. friends went to school there. I worked in the bus ministry. So I very much agreed that, yeah, that was probably the best decision because I don't want right. those things happening. Well, the next year, um, I was pretty much treated like I had the plague. <laughs> like a lot of people loved the foxes and they were really upset that they left. And I don't, I don't think my friends knew what happened, but they knew I had something to do with them leaving. Yeah. And so I was basically excommunicated that, that week I told him that Wednesday night, I told Pastor Goddard what was happening with our last week of school. Right. So those next two days I was in his office being counseled. Um, but after that, we, you know, we only went for teen activities and whatever. We weren't there like seven days a week. Um, so, but the next year was my senior year. And so all during my senior year, I cried myself to sleep every single night, every night. And my mom will attest to that. I had no friends. The four, the four of us that were really good friends, we were no longer friends. Um, I lost everything. I lost everything when I said I was being abused. I was 17. It was my senior year. It was supposed to be the best year of your high school year, right? And it was horrible. Uh, we went on a senior trip at the end of that year. Now, we had a really, really small school. So our senior class started with six and two of us graduated. But four of us were able to go on the senior trip. So we go on the senior trip and we were supposed to meet at Pastor Goddard's house that morning. And so my mom dropped me off. I was the first one. And I just remember he said, if you can't change that look on your face, you should just stay home. And I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. I knew I was hurting and lonely. I did not know what depression meant, but I am 100% convinced I had it. <laughs> Um, and I'm sure that was the look on my face and he's even used that in a, in a sermon illustration as an adult, him saying that he said that to a teenager and, mm. you know, and I think, why are you proud of that? Yeah. That's not something to be proud of that. You recognize someone was depressed and did nothing about it. <laughs> but you, do you know, um, are there any recent sermons where he said that or made that statement just so I can pull um, the, the clip? I, I tried to look back and find it. I got tired of listening to him talk. Right. <laughs> it was, was within the last five years when okay. I was there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it just, he rubs it in like it's this great thing and it's not, it's just him not acknowledging that someone needs help, you right. know? Yeah. But we went on the senior trip. He was the only adult that went, there was one teenage boy and then three of us girls or two of us girls no three of us girls and um we the girls stayed in one room and him and the teenage guy stayed in another room and one night these these two girls that went with me were part of the group of four that i was friends with for all those years um they decided to lock me out of the hotel room and so they locked me out and it was kind of a sweet so there was like a living room area and then a bedroom bathroom. That's the part they locked me out of was the bedroom bathroom. But my stuff was in there and they wouldn't open the door until the next morning, about five minutes before we were leaving. So I couldn't shower, I couldn't change my clothes, anything. But I also didn't feel like I could go tell Pastor Goddard that this happened because he didn't even like the look on my face. Like, what am I gonna do? You know, I'm just gonna be complaining. So my senior trip was horrible. My whole senior year was horrible. The only thing I wanted to do was just go to college, just move away from everyone and everything and go to college. It was an escape for me, but the foxes had moved. Pastor Goddard had moved the foxes back to Indiana. He gave them a choice of where they wanted to go and they wanted to go back to Indiana. So that is where he was. Hmm. So I didn't want to go, but I had to go to Hiles you don't go anywhere else but Hiles Anderson when you come right. from Bruce Goddard's church. So I dutifully went to Hiles Anderson. Now, when you're a freshman, 
and you go to Hiles Anderson, specifically the girls, because the girls are on work scholarship, um, you're assigned to a job when you're there. Um, for freshmen, you're, it's usually the cafeteria or the cleaning crew. I forget what they call them. The, the worst um, jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the scut jobs, you know, and you work your way up when people get to know you or whatever. And I think there's exceptions for people that were pastors, kids or whatever that, you know, somebody knew. But you all go like your whole freshman group and actually the whole, all the girls go into the chapel one day and they start announcing, you know, this if you're if names called go meet over here at this time if you're if your name's called go meet over here at this time well i was assigned to daryl moore's office which was weird because i'm a freshman why am i getting to work in an office and especially the dean of the evening college's office right like this is weird but then i thought well maybe he remembers me from meeting him when the foxes took me over there so I was thinking, wow, this is awesome. I don't have to clean toilets. I don't have to work in the cafeteria, right? Oh no, I'm fairly certain it was all for him just to keep his eye on me. Or I, I don't know. I point blank asked him one time in his office, like, why am I working for you? And he just said, do you not like working for me? And I said, no, I like working here, but I'm a freshman. Do you not like working for me? It was just like a, a a question with a question he wasn't yeah. gonna answer me you know um but i this was this was like my second year in and i was just done i was done with seeing paul fox three times a week three times a week i had to go to first baptist church and see him sit there like nothing had happened and it was so painful one thing that did happen during college at hiles anderson is i found out that there was a girl there who i knew i knew her um, from college, but that she, she was from Golden State, Pastor Trevor's church. Yeah. And well, it wasn't Golden State, it was North Valley Baptist Church. They didn't have a college then. I, someone had told me that she had had a affair, is what they called it, with her youth pastor, and she had gotten pregnant and had to give the baby up for adoption. And when I was told that story, it was almost comforting to hear that I wasn't the only one. Mm. I thought, wow, I, I'm not the only one that did this. And that was the mindset I was in that I did this. I was guilty of this, but it was somewhat comfort comforting because she was, um, she was amazing and she had a really good reputation. And I felt like I was drowning, trying to be this person that trying to prove that I wasn't the person people thought I was because I felt like I had been given this reputation. Um, another thing that interesting that happened my during that time was all the freshman girls had to take um, Christian womanhood with Marlene Evans. And <clears throat> one of the things we had to do, oh no, it was speech class with Marlene Evans. One of the things we had to do is we had to give several different kinds of speeches. One of the speeches was you had to honor someone. And, you know, one of the person I graduated high school with was at college with me, but we still weren't friends because she had been so mean to me. So she gets up there to do her speech. And, and there's probably, I don't know, several hundred girls, women in this class. And she starts crying and talking about how she used to have this friend, this best friend that she hurt and she don't know she doesn't know why she hurt them and i'm just sitting there going oh god please no please no please please don't let this be what i think this is and she like made this sash that was all glittered up said like i don't know best friend or good friend or so i don't know it was they made me go up there in front of everyone I mean, and it was her sincere way to apologize and i it wasn't lost on me that that's what he was doing. I mean, that took balls to do that, right? To get up in right. front of everyone and, and apologize like that. But I just remember thinking it was almost like um, being told you didn't deserve how they were treating you because I very much felt like I did deserve it. I didn't feel like they had a right to judge me or 
necessarily to treat me the way they were treating me, but I did feel like I had caused problems yeah. and had hurt a lot of people. And so, um, yeah, I left college after two years and went home and lived with my grandparents and started working in the medical field and ultimately became a nurse because I couldn't stay and look at him three times a week anymore. It was yeah. awkward. One time walking down the church hall, I saw him coming in a crowd and I purposefully went to the right and he still bumped shoulders with me. And it just, there was no end to it being in my face. You know, there was no moving on because nothing had ever happened. Um, there was no resolution to the situation. So um, <clears throat> I'll go back to current day. I, when I left college, I came home, I lived with my grandparents. I started going to college again. I became a nurse. I started working. Um, I ultimately got married, had kids, but I still dabbled in going to Faith Baptist. There was a period of time for a couple of years I didn't go. Um, when I first came back from college, I still tried to go. My grandparents didn't go to church, so they didn't care if I went to church or not, but I still lived with them and tried to go because I was trying to do the right thing. I was trying to be what I thought God wanted me to be. But I asked Pastor Goddard one day, because we have a really big youth group. And, but if you didn't go to Bible college, you, there was kind of nothing left for you there. And at this, at least at this time, now there's some young couples um, or young adult Sunday school classes, but then that was not a, a thing. And I remember asking Pastor Goddard, <clears throat> can we start like a college age um, Sunday school class? And he said, no. And I said, why? He said, because when you're your age, you should go to church because it's right. Not because something's here for you. And that always made me kind of mad because they had this group called King's Helpers that was for senior citizens. Yeah. And I thought, well, they come for that. Like what? So I stopped going for several years. And then once I got married, I went back. The pull to go back was most people that are in the IFB know that when they leave and they go try to find another church, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. There, it's always awkward. You don't, something's always wrong with every church you visit. Like, oh, they do this or they do that or they don't do this or because you're, you're caught up in tradition and what you knew to be church was. And so it's hard to lead. Even when we moved up here to Montana, we initially started with an IFB church. Mm. And then once Victor got arrested, I was like, nope, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> So, um, oh, so we were in and out of church, but one of the pulls that kept pulling me back to church was that my parents went to church there. Victor, my brother-in-law, my sister was the youth pastor and his wife there. My stepbrother and his wife worked, were in the ministry there. My, my stepsister, my stepsister, my sister-in-law is still Pastor Goddard's secretary. So there, there was so much of my family tied into that church. If I wanted to be a part of my family's lives, I had to be at that church because their lives were so intertwined with that church. Yeah. And I think my whole adult life, I have been trying to convince my family that I'm worth, like that I'm a good person that I, because I was very much labeled during that whole incident. Um, <clears throat> I think Rachel might've said during her podcast that Victor called me the black sheep in the family. Mm -hmm. um, I was, I was the black sheep in that family because I had done this thing, which now as an adult looking back, I didn't do any of it. I was groomed. But when you're in that situation in an IFB church, you're just as at fault, if not more for being yeah. the girl, for being the woman, mm -hmm. because you had to have done something. And it's stupid because people thought we were Amish the way yeah. we dressed. We wore these like jumper dresses that had no figure whatsoever. And yet somehow I was at fault for seducing this man. You mm -hmm. know, we weren't even taught sex ed. It was, it was, it's the mindset is so ridiculous. And mm -hmm. yet everybody just goes along with it as, as if 
that's right. I did something right. wrong. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the IFB treats women as being innately sexual, though. I, mean, I was just talking to someone about this, like, the other day. And I said the fact that they, that they act so insane about even four- and five-year-olds, like, focused on what they're wearing and skirts that cover down to the knee. And, like, and again, like, I get some of that. Like, the, you know, I don't think my daughter, like, I'm not worried about her motives when she picks out clothes. You know, there are right. certain situations where, like, I know there's creepy people in the world, so, like, I make sure that she's, like, covered in some respects. So she's, like, so right. it's not to the advantage of someone who has wrong intentions. But the way the IFB treats kids from birth is that they are innately very sexual beings. And so yeah. it, it's the opposite effect of what they say the intent is, which I, I go back and forth what their actual intent is, but they say it's to not sexualize children, but they do that times 10 with the modesty culture and all of the different rules and things that they throw down for kids from a young age. Yeah, it's so true. Even when I left Bible college and was working out in the world, I still felt like I had to keep those um, standards because mm -hmm. I didn't want some guy to like want me. Right. And to the, to the point that I took an EMT class in college, <clears throat> an emergency medical technician class, one of the things you have to do is you have to go on a ride out. You have to do two ride outs with an ambulance. That was the first time I wore pants was when I went on my ride out. And this is what happened. Our first call is a code three call for a full arrest. This guy was mowing his lawn and had a heart attack and went down in the street, like right on the curb. And we get on scene and they're like, do CPR. And I get down there in these pants and there's neighbors that have all come out because it's in this community and I'm doing CPR and I'm looking around at all of these people. And I'm thinking, no one's looking at my butt. No one cares that I'm wearing. That is the thoughts that are going through my head while I'm doing CPR. No. Because that is how ingrained no. it is in you when you grow up in that kind of culture. And at that point on, I just said, forget it. I'm not, I'm wearing pants because right. it's stupid. But that's what it took. It took me doing CPR and realizing no one cared about my butt and pants. Right. You know, it was so dumb. Um, but, you know, trying to figure out what you're going to do because you've left Bible college and, and get married and have kids and how are you going to raise your kids and just try to go on with your life. I buried this. I buried it because I wasn't allowed to talk about it. I was told by pastor Goddard, you're not allowed to talk about this with anybody. Um, the only counseling I got was his, which is primarily pray and read your Bible more. And there was a few things like he had me listen to preacher ta preaching tapes all day when I was in his office those two days. I listened to a lot of preaching tapes. He talked to me a lot, but most of it didn't make sense, like the whole treating it like a death thing. Um, and then going to college and facing him because that's what I was told to do. And and another thing, while I was in Bible college, a teenager from that church, from First Baptist, <clears throat> that was in college with me. She came up to me and told me that, um, actually she told her roommate that was from our church that Paul Fox was at their teen camp that summer. And I was like, what? So this man had had to leave our church because he sexually abused me, but he was just sent to another church where he was then again, working with a youth group, a bigger mm -hmm. youth group. So you just take him from one church and give him a whole new victim pool to choose from. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But I was trying to figure out my life and every once in a while, I, you know, I was just moving forward and every once in a while, something would come up that would just kind of bring it back to me, whether it was the name Fox or something. Mm -hmm. In 2012, when Jack Scott got arrested and that whole thing went down, that took a lot of time for me to get over because he had counseled the Foxes when they went back to Indiana. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kept thinking, what the heck was that? Were those counseling sessions like a playbook for him? Because yeah. the story of how he, what he did with the teenager he abused was very similar to what Fox did with me. And so I just thought, what is happening? It took me a long yeah. time to pass that. Well, and Victor's mirrors almost identically, you know, the same thing with the van and going, dropping off last. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, 
you know, that's where I do go like, and it's true. I mean, the, uh, I've talked to specialists that work with these kind of things and they say that, you know, pedophiles and predators are very communal. Like it's a very communal thing and they learn from each other and they, they share information with each other. And so that's the part of me where that all gets into just assuming and, and intuition about things. But like, I have to believe there's more said than not, you know, I have, I have to believe that there was more of a network of people in that world than what we can even, or probably even want to imagine because the similarities yeah. between all these stories and the, the repeats over decades, generation to generation is so similar. It's, it's, there's no way it's just coincidence. You know what I mean? It, at that point, yeah. it is a systemic thing. If nothing else, they're taught to cover it up. Right. They're, they're taught how to handle that, it. When that's it baseline. Like even, even the yeah. people who aren't offenders yeah. are taught that. Yeah. Right. Well, so I, I just lived my life struggling badly, but tried to live my life. And I didn't even know why I was struggling. I didn't know why life was so hard for me. And I'm successful. I'm a nurse. I was an ER nurse for 16 years. Now I'm a recovery room nurse. Um, I own a business, a successful business in California. We have four amazing kids. Our marriage is amazing. Nothing was ever enough for me. Like I, I was never doing a good enough job. I was always trying to prove to my mom and my family that I was worth something. Um, when we finally decided to move to Montana, it was it was super hard to leave everything, but it was the best decision we ever made. Like hands down, this is the best place for us. And it really allowed me to look at the IFB differently because I was completely out of it. Now we did go to an IFB church up here, but it wasn't that he's from Maranatha. Yeah. So it wasn't as extreme. Like they didn't care what you did during the week, as long as when you came to church, if you were going to work like in a children's class, you had to dress the part, or if you're going to be right. choir, you had to dress the part, but they didn't care. And I actually specifically asked them one time, <clears throat> I asked the pastor's wife, like, well, this was after Victor had gotten arrested. I said, well, what would happen if, you know, how would your husband handle this? If something happened and someone was accused in your church and she said, it's already happened. And he went to that man's house and picked him up and drove him straight to the police department. Hmm. And I was like, dang, like, well, that's good. But yeah. I still was so uncomfortable in the IFB that yeah. I just, we left, dwindled out. But um, so, yeah, so I floundered and just lived my life. And until two and a half years ago, when this all came up yeah. and, you know, I just remember after talking to that victim that wanted to talk to me, I just kept thinking, why is this happening? Why is this coming up right now? I am 43 years old. I do not want to deal with this. I've been trying to leave this behind for the last 20 some odd years, but I kept praying a very specific prayer. I kept saying, God, I do not want to do this, but if you open a door, I will try to have the courage to walk through it. And that is when I ended up telling my story or putting it out on Facebook. Our attorneys did that. And then, um, with the way that pastor Goddard was still lying about how everything went down, I, um, decided to sue. One of the things that happened, um, so just, I'm going to, I'm just going to walk you through the last two and a half years, because I think that it'll make everything make sense. Right. We were in Montana. I was working at Mid County detention facility as a nurse. So I was a jail nurse, 400 inmates, two sex offender pods of men. Mm -hmm. Didn't bother me. I don't know why, but it didn't bother me um, to be there and to deal with them. But I remember one time walking through there and they all were orange. And I was like, huh, this is Victor's life now. That's yeah. weird, which made it very real to me, which was good. I think it was a good thing. I had my very first anxiety attack, um, at 43 years old. Mm -hmm. I saw the clip of Victor walking into jail in orange, in shackles. And I just started crying. Like every emotion I could think of came to me. I was 
angry at him. I was, I felt like I had been abused all over again because he had used that story. I was mad at myself. And this is probably the part that I have the hardest time getting over is I was mad at myself for not fighting harder for justice when I was mm. younger, even though I can tell myself all the right things. Like you didn't even know what justice was. You, you did it the way you thought you were told to handle it. I still have a level of guilt for Victor's victims mm. that he was able to use my story to victimize girls right. and that's just something i've got to work through but there were so many emotions i was hurt for my sister i was hurt for my nieces and nephews i was mad i just had so many emotions at that moment i just was crying and hyperventilating and i didn't know what to do and so i texted my attorney and said do you have counselors on staff and he immediately called me and he ended up having a counselor call me and we just talked through it and i then i was fine um but then i you know i was working at the jail during that time so that was kind of an interesting dynamic because all the stuff's happening and then um i was working at the jail the day well I'll, i'm not gonna jump ahead i'll slow down for a minute so um i started giving interviews our attorneys asked us if we would give some interviews if we wanted to and i said i'm fine with that so I was giving these interviews and that story came out by Sarah Smith from the Star Telegram. Um, I gave an uh, interview to a news, a news outlet in California. And this was during Victor's whole um, arrest and like court proceedings. I gave this interview and I said that it had happened before. The reason why he thought he could get away with it is because it had happened before at this church and that, um, the deacons had decided to not call law enforcement. Well, this one particular deacon that I actually reached out to because he had come up to me at, at church one time at Faith Baptist as an adult, this was probably in the last six years, he had come up to me crying one day, bawling his eyes out and just said, I'm sorry for what happened to you. I'm sorry for the decisions we made that were made. Um, I, I don't sleep at night, like just broken. And like, he just caught me off guard and I didn't know what to say. And it was just super awkward. And so he just like walked away and I just felt so bad that that's how that was handled. And so once all this came out to the public, I thought I've got to reach out and talk to him because I felt bad for how that, how I responded to that, but it just caught me off guard. And it was like a 30 second conversation, just like weird. So I called him thinking, you know, we're just going to talk and I'm going to say, you know, that I appreciate him coming up to me and saying that and whatever, but he was mad. He was like kind of angry on the phone. And I'm like, what, I don't, what is happening? And he's like, why are you telling news, the media that we made the decision not to call law enforcement? And I'm like, well, because you did. And he's like, no, we didn't. He's like, when I heard that, I immediately started contacting other deacons that were in that meeting. That is not what was asked of us. And I'm like, what he said no what pastor goddard said was we've already contacted law enforcement you guys just need to decide whether we tell the church or not mm -hmm. so he pastor goddard told us the deacons decided not to call law enforcement he told the deacons we had already contacted law enforcement they're not going to press charges you need to decide if we're going to tell the church right so the picture was becoming very clear of how Bruce Goddard manipulated everyone in that situation to get the outcome he wanted. He manipulated the deacons, he manipulated my parents, he manipulated me to get the outcome he wanted, which was all of this to go away. So all of this stuff was coming out in the context of Victor's investigation, which the way it transpired into mine is um my story was involved in victor's story because he had used it he had used my story to to do his crimes so my story came out when i talked to the investigator um i just gave my story but 
um, I didn't file a police report until later. Later, I was told to file an actual police report. I didn't know if I had or not. So I called the investigator back and said, did I file one? He said, no. I said, well, I think I need to. So I, I filed an actual police report. I honestly didn't expect any of that to go anywhere because it had been 27 years. I mean, that's a long time. Statute of limitations in California were like 10 years. But during that, so, so Paul Fox started being investigated. You know, Victor had been arrested and then jointly Paul Fox started being investigated. Um, it got to the point where I was to do a pretext call. So I did end up calling him. And um, some of the things that stood out to me were when I asked specifically, why me? He said, he told me all the reasons why me were the most sincere you I don't remember everything he said but it was just like wow he answered that question so that means to me that he literally picked me out of that youth group the other thing I asked him if he loved me I asked him lots of questions um one of the interesting things that at the end of that phone call he said if you want to keep your girls safe stay away from church and I said what he said if you want to keep your girls safe stay away from church keep them out of church and i thought that was really an interesting point for a predator to make he obviously knew that in church was the place where victims can be found it's mm -hmm. a great place to victimize people i mean that's his opinion he he brought that up i didn't ask anything about that yeah. that was the last thing he wanted to say to me wow. and i just thought that was interesting um there was something else about that call i was going to mention oh i point blank asked him am i the only one and he said this are you the only one sure that is how he said it and i thought wow i'm not the only one at, at that point when i did that pretext call i had been told by two different attorneys as well as the investigator i was not his first victim yeah is too good at how he grooms me right but i didn't really want to believe it no. but that answer told me everything i needed to know i was not his first i i was still working at the jail the day that well fox was arrested in july of 2019 and um it, i'm in june sorry june of 2019 in july of 2019 he was extradited to california and there is a i forget what it's called but there is a system that you can go on so that you know when your your um your abuser is released from custody or moved to a different prison or whatever and so i got on that system and it had sent me a text that he was being extradited and i was going to work at the jail that day and i got that text and I went inside the jail. And when you go inside the jail, you have to go into like this central command area before you, there's like a big door that opens, you go into the middle, that door closes, then another door opens and then you're actually in the jail. Um, I was in there and I just got this weird feeling and then a, a guard with a prisoner walked by and it was a female prisoner. So it was, it was really weird, but it just like took my breath away. And I'd been working there for months, like no problem. I get my keys, I go down to the medical thing. And one of the first things you do is make a list of the inmates you need to see when you go out. And I, the board was up there and I could not physically write down a name. I couldn't, I like kept looking at the board and looking at the paper and I couldn't do it. And I thought, well, okay, I'll just do something else. I did some more paperwork and then I would go back to making that list. And every time I try to make a list and write down names, I would, start hyperventilating and just my heart was racing and i was like what the heck so i finally started texting other nurses saying hey can you come in and cover my shift i need to go i don't feel good whatever the nurse i was working with she was like if you need to go you know that's fine I'm like no i don't want to leave you alone i'll just wait till someone can fill in she's like no it's fine just go well i left and i could not get out of there fast enough and you have there's a process you have to go through all these doors and through this command you have to turn in your keys and like just all this stuff i got to my car and I just broke down crying, hyperventilating, like 
it was the second panic attack I'd ever had in my life, mm. both involving this situation. Right. And I called my boss and I told her, you know, I'm like, I don't know what's happening, but he was extradited today, but it doesn't seem like it's about that. And she was like, Kathy, you're a nurse. You know, trauma hits you when it hits you. Like, yeah. just go home, take some deep breath. Like, she was great about it. But it was like, and I never did go back to working at the jail. I ultimately took some time off and then I quit because I felt like that's probably not a great place to work where I'm going through right. the legal system. <laughs> um, but you know, when I was an ER nurse, there are victims that would come in, teenagers, kids that would come in having been sexually abused. And the protocols that are in place for that, we call CPS, we call the authorities. We, there's so many things that happen for that kid. And I would often think, what if these things had happened for me? Mm, yeah. Would my life be different right now? Would I be a different person? Would I be a better person had these things actually happened? And it always just struck me as odd. Like it's so surreal that here I am doing the things for victims that I wish would have done, been done for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, Sarah Jackson said that all victims need a place to tell their story. Like they need to tell their story, but, um, not always publicly. And I would totally agree with that. I think that telling your story publicly is hard. It's really hard. You're, you open yourself up to the most vulnerable place and you get a lot of good support, but there, you also get criticism and you have to be able to take that, I think, um, or ignore it, or it's just, it's going to affect you. But I do think what I've learned in the last two and a half years is that Trauma is going to stay with you and it's going to affect your life in ways that you don't even realize until you heal from it. And it, the healing process is a very long process. Um, also though, probably the thing I learned earliest on in this whole situation, these last two years was until you tell your story, you are not going to be able to heal. And I don't mean publicly, I mean, find a person that you trust and just tell them your story. I think what victims need to hear and what I wish I would have heard is, I hear you, I believe you, and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> and I'm here for whatever you need. Yeah. I got the I hear you and I believe you because Goddard believed me. He, and he took action immediately to cover it up. Yeah. But that part on I'm here for whatever you need right now, I think especially there's this movement to come out and tell your story. And when you do other survivors just rally around you and give mm -hmm. you so much support and it's so important, but your abuser holds the power until you tell your story. Yeah. If you're silenced, and you can't tell your story, your abuser is holding all the power. You have to take that back. And once you take it back, and it doesn't matter, tell one person, tell your parents, tell a, a spouse, tell a friend, it doesn't matter who you tell, you will slowly start taking back the power from your abuser when you start talking about it. And you can do it within a safe context. You don't have to be public, like some of us are being public. But until you do that, you will not heal. I, um, last month, well, actually it's November 1st. So I did it in September. Um, I went to a retreat. It's called the Haven Retreat and it's by the Unique Foundation. And it is specifically for women who were sexually abused before the age of 18. And it's a four day retreat. It's free. You just have to get yourself there. It is life changing. I've watched their little video clips on YouTube, different people, different women talking about their experience. The word that always comes up is life-changing. Mm. It propels your healing forward like years yeah. because they take you and they give you a safe space to talk about your story and they teach you how trauma affects, they use that book, um, 
the body keeps the score right they use a lot of that um knowledge as the basis for it the whole limbic system if you are abused so your limbic system which is your memory bank basically what causes you to go to fight flight or freeze if it's it's not completely um matured until like your low to mid 20s hmm. so anything that happens to you as a child before then those actions are attached to a reaction so i'll just be very frank here if you're sexually abused as a minor or a child and you are aroused when you're an adult and you're in a sexual relationship those same actions will get you aroused but will also put you back into that trigger of that trauma yeah. so if that action as a child was attached to anxiety and panic and anger your sexual experiences are also going to be attached to panic and anxiety and anger because you have to heal from that trauma. You have to retrain your brain that sex is okay yeah. or that touch is okay. And I think that it's like every woman needs to go to that retreat. Mm. It's phenomenal. And I, when I signed up, it took me 10 months to get in. Part of that was because of COVID. It's a long process, but it is so worth it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's no one that goes to that that says it's not worth it. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But I also think that, you know, the statistics are one in four women before the age of 18 will be sexually abused, which is ridiculous. But if you also add in there physical abuse, emotional abuse, institutional abuse, like all these teen homes, um, spiritual abuse, like growing up in a cult, if you take all that, it's probably one in two. Yeah. And I left that retreat thinking, if women like me are living in trauma, because I'm totally was living in the limbic system. I was, I was constantly trying to be enough and to do enough. And I was already doing it. I was doing enough, but I wasn't letting myself hear that I was doing enough because I felt like I needed to do more because I'm living from a place of shame, which is one of the right. things they teach you about. Um, if all these women, if you look at the women in the world that are doing amazing things, running big companies, running charities, making all these changes, and they're doing it from a place of trauma that they haven't healed from, if we could get these women to a retreat where they could heal we could literally change the world. Right. I mean, you really could change the world. My life changed in those four days at that retreat. There was a few times where you could pick a class to go to. One of the classes, what, at one time it was forgiveness or shame. I didn't want to go to forgiveness because I'm just not wanting to do that yet. Um, but I didn't think I had any shame. I feel like I had guilt over victor being able to use my story to hurt other girls but i didn't feel like i was living in shame but i picked that one because i definitely didn't want to go to the forgiveness class um and what they do is they talk about what shame is what do you think shame is and people say what they think it is and then they tell you what it really is and then they tell you how it represents itself in your life and then they tell you how to heal from it so everything they gave you knowledge of, you know, they taught you about, they also told you how to, to heal from it. Well, shame is if you can't take compliments, if it's hard for you to take compliments, you're living from a place of shame. If nothing is ever enough, well, I got my associate's degree and people are like, that's amazing. Well, yeah, but I got to get my bachelor's or you got your bachelor's. Well, now I got to get my master's. Like nothing's ever enough. I started a business. Well, I have to start another one. Oh, oh, your kids are awesome. Oh, well, they, they could work on this. Like if, if that is your life and that is very much who I am, I just totally summed up who I am. Um, that is all from a place of shame. And then they teach you how to heal from shame. And I think it's amazing, but I think all trauma survivors need that kind of retreat. And so for me moving forward, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to figure out how to open a retreat for survivors because theirs is specific for sexual abuse. 
And I think that that kind of needs its own lane. Um, there's some specific things you have to deal with in that, but I, I think that even just IFB cult abuse, it really does affect your life. It affects who you are. I thought it was interesting. One of your, um, I don't know if it was you that posed the question or somebody on your, on your Facebook page posed the question of, um, does anyone feel like they constantly have to explain themselves or they're, you know, just this whole thread of yeah. things came out and I thought, oh my God, that is so me. Like I'm constantly lost in the details, trying to make sure people understand where I'm coming from or what yeah. I'm saying or, you know, and I think that is because we grew up in this cult and that somehow that formulated us to have this need for people to, to make sure that people understand where we're coming from. So I think there's just this whole slew of trauma that people can heal from. And I, so I think, you know, moving forward, I just want to help other survivors. Um, I am going to court in January for Paul Fox and I'm testifying. Um, it's a preliminary hearing. So basically a step before a trial. So I think at that point after that, I think he will probably plead out because I don't think he actually wants to go to trial or go to jail. I just, he doesn't want jail time and, and the DA is unwilling to let him not have jail time, which I think is awesome. Um, and then we are supposed to go to trial next year for Faith Baptist Church, which I'm hoping will change things at that church. You know, um, Bruce Goddard covered up for Paul Fox. He moved him out of the state. He made a deal with him. That was one of the questions I asked during my pretext call was what was the conversation you had with Bruce Goddard? And what he said was, and these were in Paul Fox's words. He said, and I may, I may interpose these two words, so it's not verbatim, but he said, he came and told me that I had a choice to move. If I moved this, if I left the state, Within the next 24 hours, he would not call law enforcement. I took that deal. I moved. I never talked about it again. And I kept my end of the bargain. So in context of his conversation with Bruce Goddard, he said deal and bargain. Hmm. And I think that that speaks volumes about how that whole situation was handled, which is, again, points yeah. back to how Victor thought he could get away with it. Right. Goddard didn't know Paul Fox. He had known him for a few years on his staff. That's it. There was no relationship prior to that. And he'd let him walk away. And then you take Victor, who was in our youth group for a few years, and then on his staff for 15 years. Of course, he's going to cover for him. So he ha Bruce Goddard has a history of covering all this stuff up. Right. Like that whole situation just needs to change. And I'm hoping that this next year with our lawsuits coming to a conclusion that that is what will happen. Right. But for me personally, I want to figure out, and if somebody knows how, please contact me. I want to figure out how to do this retreat mm. for victims of abuse of any kind, yeah. because I think it's so life-changing. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested to talk to you about that a little bit, even off mic, because that's something I've I mean, I have a million different things that I think about a lot and that's one of them, um, you know, I, I think through resources, books, you know, I've thought through, you know, protests, I've thought through all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it's, I think that there's definitely people who would be helped by it. I mean, I, 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 I was telling someone just yesterday, I went to, in 2000 and, 16 I went to exponential which is a church planning conference I just went to go because one of my friends from Hawaii was there and you know of course you meet your friends in Hawaii in LA and not not in Hawaii but uh but anyway so I, I I met him there and we're walking outside and there's all these booths for church planners and you know at the time I didn't think anything of it but I remember just seeing like wow there's so many things you never think of there's you know people for your signage people for you know, designing your stage at a budget, people for this, people for insurance. And I told him, I said, now in retrospect, like when I'm doing the podcast, I'm always thinking like, why wasn't there a booth about how to secure your church, how to build up a nursery that's safe, how to, right. you know, how to do background checks. Like there wasn't anyone there 
at least that I noticed at the time, maybe there was, and I wasn't thinking in that frame of mind yet, but I just, I think there's such a, there's a dearth of information for like pastors, you know, there, there's a, there's a need for all of this training. And then there's also like for the side of, like you said, yeah, sexual abuse is a big component, but there's also the psychological abuse. There's the emotional trauma. I mean, I, just this last week, I told you a little bit beforehand, um, before we got on the call, it's been a pretty tough week. And there was a lot of stuff for me, like not physical trauma, just pure emotional trauma that was reopened. Like, and it was as fresh as, you know, me being a 16 or 17 yeah. year old again. And yeah, I, I always, I'm always thinking about that. I'm like, man, it'd be so cool to get a conference, you know, a convention center hall or get a, you know, campground or something. And yeah, I don't even know who you, I guess the group, but I mean, I don't even know who you market it to, but I just think there's people that know they need like a, a community of people to know that it's kind of the hashtag that um, breaking code silence always uses the ICU survivor. Like it's, it's seeing people just saying like, I see you, I know what you went through. I know that you were, you were spiritually manipulated to do things that you know, you were, you were betrayed, you were abandoned by people when you didn't meet their standards, like yep. just that stuff. There's not something specifically for those people. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you set something up like that, I mean, definitely let me know. Um, but I mean, I also, I mean, that's something I'd love to, you know, be a part of and, and try to make something like that happen. I just don't like many things in life. I don't know where to even start doing that. Um, and what that looks well, like, but the unique foundation what they did is they started the unique makeup company right. and they did it for the sole purpose of feeding the foundation mm -hmm. which would then put on this retreat to help women heal Interesting. so i think i have an idea for a business to feed a foundation that would do these mm -hmm. retreats and i think it's really good i'll tell you off camera because okay. i just i don't want someone to take the idea and run with it and not use it for the purpose that I think yeah, it right. should be for because it's a really good idea. Um, but I, I think the way they set it up and their Perfect. story is really neat. Um, but the way they set it up was just so that the whole purpose of that business was to fund hmm. that, which is, I right. think what we would have to do because, yeah. and then once you're up and running, then you can have people donate. But yeah. I, I do think it's something that's definitely needed. I think, when I left that retreat, I mean, I was sitting in the airport waiting for my plane to come home and it came to me and I, I just knew it was the right thing to do. Like mm -hmm. I knew that's what I was supposed to do. And I think that one of the things that is very helpful in healing is to find purpose yeah. in your trauma. Yeah. And for me, um, I think this is it. I think this is what I'm supposed to do with this. And so hopefully the next time I talk to you, it's somewhere further down in the works, you know, right. and <laughs> Yeah, no. way to happening. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, yeah, I feel that same thing. And I feel like, you know, this, I mean, the podcast has been, it's ironic this week because this week's been one of the like hardest weeks since it was one of those, like, why bring this upon myself? You know, like I'm kind of, I'm, yeah. I'm putting myself, into, but then also in the grand scheme of things, like it's been one of the most healing and helpful things. Like even just me getting able to, you know, I know there's people that get mad when I start rambling, but like, even there's times where like I click into the mode, I'm like, I'm figuring something out. Like I'm talking through this, I'm understanding. Like even yeah. talking with, you know, we mentioned Rachel's episode, like even talking to her and I was like, yeah, like you would, you'd be trying to live the way that they told you and they would move the goalposts of like what was perfection. So you'd have to constantly right. be striving for acceptance. And like, yeah. I, I, I knew that subconsciously, but I never really put that into those words. And now I'm like, man, that's why I struggle now when I'm like dealing with someone and they, they do something nice for me or they, I'm like, are you just setting me up to like have to move again and start sprinting back toward your acceptance? And yeah, anyway, all that, all that stuff's super helpful, but you know, like when, when you start seeing, you know, platform grow, you start seeing the ability to do more and help more, like it's super fulfilling and it's just a really the the most frustrating thing for me now is just like there's a million things to be done <laughs> like there's not enough time yeah. to do it all you know but it's a yeah but i mean it's it's a good place to be i think so but um 
but yeah, yeah no, you, def- just, oh, you have to stay encouraged. You have to, because yeah. the naysayers are out there. And I, I, after Paul Fox was arrested, I got a, t- a message on messenger. I didn't know the person. Um, and it turns out that it was a friend of his. And he said, I've known him for this many years and this is not who he is. And there's holes in your story and blah, 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 blah. And I instantly was 15 in my mind Mm -hmm. and going, what's, where's the holes in my story? What did, what's not right? Right. What did I mess something up? Like what I was instantly this teenager again. And I had to remind myself, you are an adult. You are looking back on this like an adult. This guy is just trying to persuade you that you're wrong, you know, and it's interesting that when you talk about this stuff or when trauma comes up, it's, you're immediately the age you were Mm -hmm. in the middle of it. You're even maturity wise. You're just like, wait, what? You have to like remind yourself where you are. I'm an adult, you know, I can think through this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing they talked about a lot at that retreat was like reminding yourself you're safe. You're in this place. Like, Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's just, that's how trauma works in your brain, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm hoping there'll be a part three to this soon where we can talk through progress with this. I I know the, I know the legal process has been obnoxiously slow. Um, and I know, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be done. Um, but I, I'm hoping that we, as we see more progress, we can keep chatting and, you know, even, even off the show, I'd love to stay in touch and just, you know, like I said, yeah. there's a lot of things where just community, like I said, is good and, and it helps being able to figure out like what to do and how to help. And so, um, yeah. Yeah. I do think that somebody needs to take up that cause of the legal system. I do think that yeah. it's broken when it comes to victims. I mean, two and a half years we've been doing this. Right. Um, you know, my investigation started, I think in August of 2018 yeah. and it's, it's not for the faint of heart. I'll tell you that right. <laughs> it's not fair to the victims. The, the defendant gets all of the rights in court. Now they give you a book of rights, like your rights as a victim. Um, but in reality, the defendant pulls all the strings, or I should say the defense attorney <laughs> yeah. pulls all the strings and delay is one of their tactics. And it right. sucks because it makes it take forever. And you're trying to live your life while still like living currently in this trauma so I do think that's something that needs to change. It's it's not something I'm interested in leading the charge on. I think I want to focus more on helping people heal. Yeah. But I do think it's somebody needs to advocate for that change because it's, it's right. not working. Right. And I mean, yeah, and it, it'll probably end up needing to be somebody in that legal field, you know, somebody who can, because right, right. like, that's another one of those things like, yeah, there needs to be a reform, but I don't know where to start advocating for that you know I mean I don't yeah, know where to either. start doing that not but, my world <laughs> yeah but um but no well, I, I appreciate you sharing and I know like even doing interviews like this it's not it, it's not the best thing to be talking about it's not the you know that's an understatement it's not easy to discuss but I appreciate you you doing it and taking the time now twice to to sit down and share openly um and I think what you said a few minutes ago about just the importance of sharing your story. Like, I hope just that, I hope that there's people listening and I'll just say this too. Cause I always say this privately when people reach out, like my number one goal when someone reaches out is like, not, Hey, can I get you on the show? Cause I have a, a shocking amount of people that reach out that I end up pushing to joy with out of the shadow or some, someone else to talk to. Um, but just find somebody like find somebody and make sure you're doing what's going to be best for you, you know, and you may not know that till you start sharing it, like what the best thing is going to be, but, um, just be willing to share with somebody and reach out to somebody who understands. Um, I, I really don't, most people that reach out and they're like, I've never told anybody this. I try to say like, well, who can don't you tell, tell first? Like, don't, <laughs> don't tell thousands of people first thing, like yeah. try to find someone, you know, and some still want to go forward. And, you know, again, I'm not going to tell them not to do it the way that they want to do right. it, but right. um, just know, and if you, oh, sorry, go ahead. I think you need to have some power behind you. I think you yeah. need to have told your story in a safe place where people right. rallied around you and said, I hear you. I believe you. I'm supporting you. It gives you the foundation to be able to publicly tell your story, yeah. but 
I do keep talking about it for that reason, because it does hearing someone tell their story and seeing the support that they get does help you as a survivor feel like you can then maybe tell yours. Right. And so I do keep talking about it for that reason, because I want other victims to be able to tell their story because it is the start of the healing process. You cannot heal from a trauma you're not allowed to talk about. Right. You have to talk about it. Hmm. So I, I do keep talking for that reason. I want, I've told my story, pretty much everybody should know it by now. It's yeah. public, it's, you know, it's in the paper. But I, I do keep talking about it because I want people to, to be comfortable telling their story. I want it to encourage people to tell their story. That's awesome. It's, it's so important. Yeah. Well, I hope this episode does just that. And um, I just want to thank everybody for listening. And is there a place if someone did want to, and I'll cut this question completely, but if, is there a place that you want people <laughs> to connect with you if they're saying like, oh, I resonate with your story? Is there any public platform they can do that on? Or? Um, my Facebook page is just my name. I mean, you can get a hold of me in Messenger. That's primarily what I'm on. Um, I can give you my email if you want that. It's kind of long though. <laughs> okay. I can put it in it's, the show notes. Okay. It's, I'll, I'll tell you, but it's long. It's D U R B R N E M T P at AOL.com. And it's so old. It's AOL. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for listening to the preacher boys podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, Please leave a review on iTunes and don't forget to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter with the handle at Preacher Boys Doc. Additional information can always be found on PreacherBoysDoc.com.